event scripting uh, using the SFIS script tasking components. Uh, so this is uh, basically the functionality that you can use to extend SFIS to make it do pretty much, well, anything you want it to do. Uh, we're going to focus in on um, one example for the script task and then a couple of examples of script components. And uh, we won't show anything too complicated from a .NET coding standpoint. Um, uh, I will walk through what we do show there uh, to make sure it's, it's clear, but um, the, the goal isn't necessarily to uh, show all the capabilities of the .NET framework. Uh, that would take multiple days to, to actually cover. Uh, but primarily to just show some of the, the more common things that you can do with it uh, from a scripting standpoint uh, that are useful from SSIS. So uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a SQL Server MVP. Um, I work a lot with analysis services as well as SSIS. Uh, I've uh, worked on several books around this. Uh, and the most important thing on this slide is my contact information. Uh, so you can find my blog at agilebi.com slash jwelch uh, or reach out to me via Twitter or email. Um, the blog in this case is, uh, I wouldn't say particularly important, but <laughs> I do have a lot of script examples out there on the blog. So uh, if you are, want more examples uh, after going through what I'm uh, seeing in this presentation, uh, the, the blog has, has quite a bit that's uh, been out there for a while. Um, I don't a lot on Twitter, but uh, I do try to respond to uh, anything directed to me on there, uh, as well as uh, there's always emailing me at jwelch.com. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about script tasks and what you can do with those. We're going to talk about uh, script components uh, and show a couple of examples of those. Uh, and there is um, a little bit we're going to discuss with asynchronous components. Uh, we won't be showing a demo of that today just due to the time constraint, but uh, uh, we will talk a little bit about some of the, the capabilities there uh, and a few tips and tricks and also uh, keeping it dry, which if you've ever read any of the pragmatic programming books, you, you might recognize that acronym. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll be defining it later, so don't worry if you don't recognize it. So uh, starting off on script tasks, these are basically the Swiss Army knife in SSIS. Uh, they can do pretty much anything you can do in the .NET framework you can do inside of a script task. They don't enforce very much structure. Uh, they are basically uh, kind of a blank slate as far as what kind of functionality you want to interact or put into them. They are a little bit constrained. Uh, so script tasks work just like any other task in SSIS. Uh, they are basically a self-contained unit of work. They can talk to external resources and manipulate a few things from a package standpoint, uh, such as um, loading variables, interacting with connections, those types of things. But they really don't let you do a whole lot more than that. Um, however, again, what, what you can do internally in a script task is pretty much un un unlimited. So this uh, tends to be used a lot when you need to um, be able to talk to an external resource, control some sort of external process, uh, those types of things. So one of the classic examples of using a script task in SSIS is to do a secure FTP, because that's not one of the built-in components. So uh, let's take an example, or sorry, look at an example of this. And what we're looking at here is the ability to pull an ordered file list off the file system. So you can use a for each file enumerator inside of SSIS. However, this gives you limited control over the ordering of the files. Uh, you can do some filtering in those using file masks. So you can uh, use your typical wildcard uh, file searching um, to filter out certain file names that you're not interested in or certain extensions you don't care about. But if you need the files to come in in a specific order, you can't really control that uh, directly through the, the for each file enumerator. So in this case, uh, we're going to make use of a script task uh, in order to do the ordering for us. And this shows a couple of things. It shows uh, how you can interact with variables via the script task, uh, and also how you can store the results of the processing that you're doing in the script task in a variable that can then be consumed by later tasks within the package. 
So let's take a look at this first. Um, so the first thing we want in our script task, uh, you'll notice we have our read-only variables and our read-write variables. Uh, so effectively putting a value in this list, sorry, I'm on a dual monitor setup, and uh, Visual Studio being the, the friendly animal that it is, constantly wants to put my dialogues on the wrong monitor, but it's just one of those things. So when we add values here, this is effectively telling SSIS that we want this script task to lock this variable uh, either for reading from it, meaning we can access it but we could be writing to it, uh, or as rewrite, meaning we can write to it. Um, this basically is a placeholder for code you can do yourself. However, it's recommended that in general you use the properties read-only variables and rewrite variables to set this up, uh, not only because it saves you writing a little bit of code, but also because it provides a little bit more metadata uh, from an SSIS standpoint, letting it know that those variables are being used. There are cases where you may want to re-lock the variables uh, internally, uh, and I'll, I'll show just an example of that, um, or I'll show the, the functions that you can use for that. Generally, you don't have to do that, so it's, it's more of an edge scenario, um, but it does come up on occasion when you need to uh, have a variable locked for a very short period of time. So we'll go ahead and edit the script here. And we'll wait just a second for that to come up. One of the uh, other uh, lovely features we have with Visual Studio when we're working on scripts is that it launches a separate instance of Visual Studio that uh, no matter how many times you launch it, never seems to get any faster. So in this, uh, we're, as I mentioned before, we've added certain variables to our read and our read-write variables collection. So to, to reference those, we just use the DTS variables object, and we can reference them by name, grab the value. The, now the value is going to come in as an object because SSIS doesn't understand what's in the variable, so we have to actually cast it to a string in this case. So we're grabbing a folder path, so that's a variable that tells us what folder we want to enumerate the files from. We're also grabbing a file mask. And this is uh, basically our wildcard search. So it's how we can filter out extensions and those types of things. I'm doing a little bit of rudimentary error checking. Uh, so we're using the directory object. If you're not familiar with .NET, this is in the system IO namespace. Let me show that real quick. Uh, this is one of your go-to namespaces, uh, system IO. Anytime you're doing any type of file operations, the objects you need are probably going to be found in here. So definitely a good one to be familiar with. So the directory uh, class here lets us interact with directories. And in this case, we're checking to make sure our folder path exists. Um, always good inside your scripts to do a little bit of error checking. Uh, these can be painful to debug, particularly if they blow up in runtime while it's out on the server. Not too bad if it, if it happens in your development environment, but uh, when something's running in production and a folder doesn't exist, you don't always get a real meaningful error message out of the script. So doing some some checking within the script itself uh, can save you a lot of headaches down the road. So if the directory does not exist, then we're going to use the DTS events to fire an error. Now this is a, the DTS variables, DTS events, these are wrappers that are automatically created for you within the script path that reference the underlying SSIS infrastructure. So these you can think of as just shortcuts to uh, interacting with the SSIS object. So in this case, uh, we're going to fire an error message. So this will actually write to our log uh, and show up in the output from the, um, the screen, uh, or show up in the output uh, in the, the logging messages as an error telling us that the folder does not exist if, in fact, it doesn't exist. And we can't really do anything else, so we go ahead and return a failure, um, indicating that the script has failed to process, uh, and we return from that. Assuming that we did find the file, then we're going to call directory enumerate files, and this basically gives us a list of string values that are all the files that we found in that folder path that actually meet the file mask we passed in. 
again, file masks would be something like a, you know star dot star, star dot text, something along those lines that, that says what files do we want, want to actually process. Uh, we're also using the system dot link namespace a little bit here, so uh, referenced up here. Again, another very valuable namespace to be familiar with. Um, the link extensions uh, do a lot of things, but the primary thing that I use them for is working with collections of objects. Uh, so they make a lot of operations on collections much easier, much cleaner to read. So in this case, I have this file list is actually a collection of strings that are the files that we found that meet the file mask that we have. So the select uh, actually lets me take that each of those strings and cast it to a new file info object. So file info gives us a good bit more detail. It tells us um, the properties of the file when the last time it was created, modified, et cetera, uh, security information about who has access to the file. Uh, there's a whole variety of things we can get to once we have a file info reference to that particular file. So we're creating that by just creating a new file info object and passing in the current item, which again is the string path to the file that we found. Um, this select actually does that for every item in the collection and stores that in a new collection that's now, instead of being a collection of strings, is now a collection of file info objects. And then those, uh, we're able to do an order by, again, one of those link functions that makes things very uh, easy to get, again, a new collection that in this case is file info objects ordered by the last time they were written to, the last time they were modified. And then finally, we pull out the full name from the file info object. So again, this is that full string to, uh, path to the file. Uh, we pull it out in the form of a list, and we write it back to our file list variable, and we return success. So at the end of the script, as you can see, not, not a whole lot of code required for this. Uh, again, one of the beauties of being able to leverage .NET uh, in, in this is it, it can make certain operations that would be complex, but not impossible in SSIS. Uh, you can really wrap them down into very small uh, chunks of functionality. So we're able to take this, put it back into a variable, and at the end of processing the script, then we can go back to a, another for each loop. Uh, and in this case, we're going to do a for each from variable enumerator. And we're using our file list variable. Again, this is at this point, file list just contains a collection of strings that represent each path. Uh, we map that to a variable that we have for our loop. Uh, and then this, this is just a simple script task that does nothing more than log the file name uh, that uh, is being passed in to that variable. So I'm going to go ahead and run this so we can take a look at what it's doing. And it completed successfully. And if we look over here at the progress window, let me just uh, zoom in on this a little bit. You can see that we found three files. Uh, that matched our file maps, um, which was star.txt, which is sample2, sample3, and sample1. Uh, so rather than ordering by name, this is actually ordered by the modified date. Uh, so these are exactly the results we were expecting. Again, just a, a really quick sample of, of how you can use the script task. The primary thing to remember with the script task, again, what you do inside the script task itself and let me just uh, jump in here once again real quick, as quick as we can get into the, the uh, script editor. Like I said, no matter how many times you run it, it doesn't seem like it actually caches anything. It takes the same amount of time to bring it up. Pretty much everything that we have inside of this main function, all of this code, this is ours to do with what we want to. Um, the script task does not care really what you do in here. All it's going to do is when that task is executed, it's going to call this main function. It's going to do whatever you do. Um, it's going to interact with variables, connection managers, et cetera, if you, if you um, add references to those things. But this is a blank canvas. Uh, if you want to use it to delete your entire file system, you can do that. I don't recommend that, but it's, it's certainly a possibility. Um, you can do pretty much anything in here. But you are a little bit limited, particularly when it comes to processing data, because this is one 
operation that's going to get performed when it's finished is done. Uh, it does not um, let you interact with data in the same way that data flow components do. So that is why for our next piece, we are going to talk a little bit more about script components. Uh, so hopefully everybody is able to uh, see my slide now um, on the script components. So these pieces are very much focused on data processing, uh, as pretty much anything in the data flow is. Uh, it's one of three operations, getting data into the data flow, getting data out of the data flow in the form of a destination, uh, and modifying the data that's, that's processing through the data flow. Um, you can write scripts for each of these scenarios, so you can use a script to pull data in. Um, this is particularly useful in the case that you're interacting with a source that's not supported out of the box inside of SSIS. Um, it could be a web service that you need to retrieve information from. Uh, it could be processing a complex XML file. Uh, the built-in XML source doesn't always do that very well. Um, you can also write out using a script destination component. Uh, and again, anything that SSIS doesn't natively connect to, you can use a script to uh, implement that. Uh, we're not going to talk a lot about those, uh, again, just due to time constraints today. Uh, we're primarily going to talk about the transformation. Um, the big thing, and, and I'll talk a little bit uh, as we get into the, the uh, transformations about the structure of those, but I did want to mention that uh, the structure of the source, uh, basically you're outputting rows. So there is no incoming input, and you're responsible for effectively getting the information from wherever you get it from, and then writing it to output, output buffers in SSIS. Uh, so um, it's a slightly different programming model than what you're going to see for the uh, transforms. When you create a script component, it will prompt you to say what type you want to, to use, and that will actually create the appropriate infrastructure of the script component to do the processing that you're looking to do. Uh, same thing on destination. For it, it does look a lot closer to a transform because you still accept data coming in row by row and choose how you want to write it out. Um, so it's, it's a lot closer to what you see in a transformation. Uh, the only def difference is, is typically you're not passing information along from a destination at the stopping point for it. Uh, script components do have a good bit more structure uh, enforced within them. So unlike the script task where you kind of have a blank canvas, you get to choose what you'd like to do. Um, you actually have to, in, in a script component, you have to conform somewhat to what SSIS, SSIS expects. Uh, and that's because you are working in the context of a data flow. So data flows operate in a certain way. They operate on uh, buffers of information. The script component itself adds some additional handling into that process. Uh, so it really attempts to take even the data flow processing and make it easier uh, which generally is good, and you can make use of. Occasionally, it can be a little bit painful because they have some of the better functionality in SSIS from you uh, in the interest of making it simple. So we'll, we'll talk a little, little bit about how you can see what's going on behind the scenes and, and how that opens up, opens up some additional possibility. Uh, things that you want to do with the script component, again, pulling information in from uh, sources that aren't supported out of the box, writing out to those sources, both great uses of, of script sources and script destination. For transformations, uh, doing complex data manipulation. Uh, so there's some things that can be done in SSIS uh, that might require a whole series of transformations and perhaps uh, complex conditional splits that then union all back together to reassemble the data the way you need it. Uh, sometimes those things are better suited to just write a simple script to accomplish the same thing. Um, they also can be very useful for um, controlling how the data is flowing through the component. And we'll, we'll see an example of uh, both of these things uh, coming up. So uh, for the first one, let's take a look at uh, preparing some running totals. So basically what we're going to do here is look at a list of employees by department, and we're going to uh, store for each row that passes through a cumulative total of their salaries and also a running average of the salaries for the employees in that department. 
And this shows a couple of things. One, it shows uh, how we can basically carry information from row to row and strip components uh, to do some more complex calculations. Uh, and it also uh, gives us kind of a basic uh, introduction to, to how the strip component works. I'm going to flip over to that. Let me make this slide out of here. And go to running totals. So here we have a single data flow. And I'm just going to show a couple of key pieces of this. Uh, one thing is, to do our running totals correctly, we need to make sure things are ordered by the department because we want our totals to be per department. Uh, so in the OLEDB source for this, we're ordering by the department ID and we make sure to uh, flag that our output is sorted and that we're sorted by the department ID. The script does not enforce that that is sorted currently. So that, that is uh, something that can be added to scripts where you can actually inspect the metadata pulling into the script um, and is a good idea for scripts that are used in any type of production scenario just to, again, add that checking. Um, particularly because on something like this, if the data is not sorted properly, you can get very invalid results that it will not give you an error message. Uh, so that's, that's generally not a, a happy scenario for, for things running in production. Okay, so a little bit about the scripts uh, itself. Again, this one's already been added, so um, let me just to show this real quickly in case anybody hasn't seen this. If we add a new script component, the first thing it's going to ask you is what type of script you want. It defaults to transformation. That's the type that shows for this. Um, using a source or destination, again, uh, changes the internal structure that's created in the script a little bit. Uh, but uh, not, not too significantly, particularly in the case of the destination. So when we look at the scripts, uh, we have a couple of things. Again, the same read-write, read-only variables, and read-write variables, similar to what we had with the script task. So we can populate that. Uh, and we have a couple of new things. We have input columns. So these are the columns in the data flow pipeline that we actually want the scripts to interact with. In this case, um, we have two things that we care about. We want to make sure we can see the department ID uh, because that's what we're grouping on. And we want to be able to see the salary because that's what we're actually totaling and averaging. Uh, and we can control the usage type. So it can be read-only or read-write. Um, generally, you want to make sure to set this appropriately. Um, there's no reason to get read-write access to a column that you're not going to be uh, reading. Um, also, sometimes you'll see uh, beginning script developers go in and just select all the available input columns. Uh, there's actually a performance cost associated with that. So in general, you only want to select the columns that your script component really needs to interact with. Um, the performance cost is because uh, it basically has to, to capture some additional metadata, and it tells the pipeline that it's, it's interacting with these additional components, even though they're not actually being touched. So generally, try to limit this to just what you need. We also have the inputs and outputs. So generally with uh, script transforms, we don't mess a lot with the input columns. That's defined by what's coming uh, from upstream. But in this case, we actually want to alter what we're outputting. So on the outputs, um, and this is by default, it's going to create an output that is synchronous with the input. So the synchronous ID property, if I can make this a little bit bigger. Uh, is mapped to our input zero. And that basically, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later, but that basically means for every row coming in on the input, we're going to output the, the same row on the output. Um, but we do want this to modify what's getting uh, produced a little bit. So we've added two columns. We've added salary running average, and we've added salary running total. Uh, so here we just we give these a name. We give them a data type, uh, and then they're now available in the script component for us to interact with. So I'm going to, oh, sorry, I should not have canceled that. I should have hit edit script. Um, let's go into that, and we'll take a look at uh, what's actually happening in there. And I will pull this again from my second monitor. So a couple of things that are going on in here. Again, the script itself, 
fairly uh, straightforward in terms of the, uh, the code logic that we're doing, but a couple of things um, to, to be aware of. We're initializing several uh, class level variables. Uh, so these, these are instance variables that, that the reason that we're using this is these values will be retained basically for the entire ex execution time of the script. So rather than being reset uh, for every row that's processed, these actually maintain their state uh, until the data flow finishes executing. So this is important because within here, as we get each row, which is what this process input row does, uh, it's going to pass us each row that's being passed to the component. We're going to check to see does the department ID match the current department. So it's important that the initial value for current department ID is a value that's not going to be found in our actual data. So in my case, I know department ID start with one, so using a value of negative one is safe. I'm never going to encounter that in the real world. Um, anytime you're doing this type of logic that needs to do grouping, you need to make very sure that the initial value is not a possible real value for that. Uh, is that can uh, <laughs> severely impact uh, a lot of the, the logic and the results that you see. So in this case, uh, the first row that we get we know current department ID is not going to match the row department ID. So we're going to go through the process of resetting all the variables that we have. So we make the current department ID the value of the current department. Uh, we reset our running salary total and our running salary average back to zero, and we reset our department employee count to zero. Now, at this point, we're ready to start processing. This is also the exact same processing that we do if the departments did match. So in this case, we want to increment the employee count. So we don't really need a breakpoint on that one. Um, and we want to uh, accumulate our salary. So in C sharp, the plus equal just basically says take the current value of running salary total and add row salary to it. Uh, and then we're going to cal calculate an updated running salary average by taking our um, total salary and dividing it by the employee count. And then we're going to write these values that we've calculated back to the row to those two new alpha columns that we created, salary running average and salary running total. So before I leave this, uh, I'm going to show just a couple of other pieces. So we're in the main CS within the script project. Uh, as you can see over here, there's a couple of other things that are actually part of this. One is the component wrapper. So if you open this up, uh, you'll notice it's not auto-generated code. Don't change this stuff. If you do, every time you reopen a script component, it's going to get uh, overridden. Um, also, if you edit this, very bad things can happen. Uh, so you do want to be careful with that. However, this is really useful to look at because you can see what code they're actually generating behind the scenes to enable some of those pieces. Um, so in particular, uh, one of the things that is interesting is this input zero process input. So they're doing a couple of steps here. They're overriding this process input function, and they are verifying that the input is the one they expect, input zero, which is the only input. And then they call input zero process input, and they pass each row to that. So this is basically how the magic happens in process input row, that we get a row object. And if we look at it real quick, See that our row object has the columns defined um, already. That's basically because of the fact that they've implemented this or they've automatically generated the code behind the scene that hides the fact that under the covers, this is just a standard data flow buffer uh, that doesn't um, provide this level of detail. They're adding a wrapper around it that gives us a row that looks like what we expect our rows to look like. Uh, so this is great in terms of easy use. It also hides some of the power of the data flow in some cases. So um, primarily just wanted to point that out so that you know you can go here, you can take a look and see what's happening. Uh, if you want to see how they're wrapping the actual buffer, uh, the buffer wrapper um, class does that. So you can see where they define properties for each column that we're interested in. Again, these are the columns that we either mapped as being uh, input columns that we have access to or output columns. Um, and it auto generates the is null methods and it auto generates uh, the accessors for those properties. 
I'm, again, noticing department ID, that was workers read only, so we only have a get for that. We don't have the ability to set it. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and run this. Let me see our data flow. And we're using a data viewer to just check our results here. Make this a little bit bigger. And increase this so we can see um, as each row is being processed here, uh, we're actually accumulating a running total for the salary uh, and we're calculating a running average. So you can see those values are being reflected here um, as, as they should be. So, again, uh, just this gives you a pretty good example of how you can use the scripts to actually cache values. So a lot of times what people need to do in data flow processing uh, is to actually look at a value that was processed on a previous row and use that to influence the, influence the processing of the current row. Uh, and this is an example of how to do that, uh, how you can basically keep those values uh, cached between individual rows. Um, one other thing I do want to point out in the script for this. Sorry, I should have done this before I closed it. Now we're going to have to wait for five seconds for it to open back up. Um, you'll notice that these are persistent, uh, as I mentioned earlier, between rows. But we're only storing a very small amount of value, or a small amount of data here. We're storing two integers and we're storing two decimals. Um, sometimes uh, people beginning with scripts will cache quite a bit of information. They may cache every previous row that they've been processing. That is generally not a good approach uh, because the thing to remember is you may be testing this like we just were with 20 rows of data. Um, caching all the in incoming data uh, is fine in those scenarios. However, if you start getting into real production loads with potentially millions of rows, you can easily exceed the system memory uh, with, if, if you're caching full data sets. So as a general thing, you want to make sure that what you maintain, any data that's being maintained for more than a lifetime of processing a single row is as small as it can possibly be. So in this case, again, not a big deal. This is a very, very tiny amount of data. But if we were accumulating every row, storing that in some sort of collection, that can add up quite a bit more, and we want to be careful not to do that. If you do have to maintain data across multiple rows, uh, you want to make sure that you clear that data out as soon as you possibly can. Okay. Uh, the next script that we're going to take a look at, <coughs> this is dynamic business rules. Uh, so again, another useful feature uh, of the scripting in SSIS is that we can actually make our packages more flexible by leveraging the script to basically do some dynamic things that don't involve us having to hard code everything. Uh, so this piece has, has a couple of um, set up pieces for it. Uh, this does show how to use an external connection uh, within the script. And I'm going to just quickly show a table that we have as part of the database that's included in the sample for this. So basically the business scenario we have is we have multiple types of products. Uh, we have shoes, we have shirts, we have pants, we have coats, we have bags. Uh, each of these, um, while they're all stored in a common product table, that very quickly um, with the product's name, its size, its color, its capacity. Uh, capacity is not a universal fill. That's actually only used for bags. Uh, so that's why it allows nulls. Uh, everything does have size and color, but the range of values for size and color differ, differ based on the product type ID. So shirts and pants uh, use one set of sizes. Shoes use a different set of sizes. Um, so what we want to be able to do is validate in our processing that the values for these fields are in a list of valid values. So we have a product validation table. And this basically tracks uh, three things. It tracks what's the product type, what's the field name. So this is typically going to be size, color, one of those values. And what's a list of valid values that can appear in that, street, that field. Uh, and in our case, uh, for 
simplicity safe, we're using just a, a comma separated list of values. I can show you really quickly. This is the uh, data that's being loaded for the sample, and these are the values that are being loaded at the product validation. So for product type one, which is uh, shoes, we're loading a field name of size and then a comma separated list of uh, shoe sizes. Um, same thing on uh, colors, we have a, a list of valid colors and then sizes for other things as well as capacities for bank. So that's uh, some of the stuff that's behind the scenes on, on this particular uh, demonstration so that you have a better understanding of, of what we're actually doing with this for us. So what we want to do is leverage that table that we were just looking at uh, to compare with the products that we're pulling in from our database. Again, we're just pulling in everything from the product table. Uh, and we're going to run that through a script, which determines do the field values for those fields actually meet the rules or not. And it's going to direct the rows to either a valid rows output or an invalid rows output. So let's take a look at how this is being done. Um, no variables involved in this one. Uh, we do have a number of input columns, so we need to see the product type ID. That's so we know which set of rules to apply. Uh, and we need to map the three fields that we're actually going to be processing, size, color, and capacity. Uh, and that's going to let us uh, actually compare the values in those fields to what's in our business rules table. On the inputs and outputs, so we still have a single input. Uh, in this case, we actually have two outputs. So we have valid rows. We haven't changed anything about this. If the row is valid, we don't need to capture any additional information. We're just going to send it to that, to that output. Uh, and we have invalid rows. For invalid rows, we're going to capture two additional columns. What's the field name that uh, had a problem? And an error message to tell us what we actually found uh, invalid about that particular row. Now, one thing that we do want to do on this, uh, because we're sending the same set of rows uh, both of these outputs are synchronous, meaning that for every row coming in on the input, we expect that row to go out on the output. But we have two different outputs here. So we're also setting this exclusion group property. The exclusion group uh, is set to the same value on both of these. And this basically says, okay, within these two outputs, we can send rows to either one of these, and it's okay. Um, Behind the scenes, we're not really changing the shape of things. It's it's using some uh, interesting uh, magic behind the scenes so that it's still referencing the same row. It just knows that row is only going to show up for components on one output path or the other output path. Um, so the exclusion group is how we indicate that, yes, these two outputs are effectively grouped together and the rows that are sent to one are not necessarily going to be visible on the other. Um, in fact, you can actually multicast rows uh, using this so that uh, we can send all of our valid rows down in valid rows as well. But in this case, we want to send uh, invalid rows to a different out, uh, to a different place to be stored and processed separately. Uh, and we also have a reference to a connection path. So when we do this, uh, we need to give it a name. This is the name that the component is going to use to refer to the connection manager. Uh, and we need to map it to one of the connection managers to find in our package. You can map to any type of connection manager. Your life will be much, much simpler if you map to an ADO.net connection manager. Because in, internally in the script, you are using .NET code. Uh, it's a lot easier to just go ahead and use an ADO.net connection manager um, to, to interact with. And that way, uh, you don't have to do any casting or any complex logic in order to, to get the actual connection reference. So I highly recommend that. There are ways to work around that. If you do. So we have that. Uh, let's go back and actually dive into our scripts. So and then we'll wait uh, just a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds, fortunately, uh, for the script to come up. So this one is a little bit more complicated. Than, than what we looked at so far. A uh, few more things going on here. So one, we need to store the validation rules. So hypothetically, 
as every row comes in, we could go look up in the database table to say what's the validation rule for this particular product type, uh, what's the set of fields we need to validate, etc. Um, that is going to be slow because that means for every row being processed, we have to go make a database connection, retrieve some data, pull it back in. The next row that comes in may be the exact same product type, so we're basically duplicating the same effort. So instead, we want to cache this information up front so we spend the minimal amount of time actually getting the data. So again, we're defining an instance level um, variable, validation rules, uh, and this is storing a collection that is a dictionary. So if you're not familiar with dictionaries, those are basically a keyed, uh, key value pair collection. So for each item in the dictionary, we have a key and we have the value for it. Uh, this one is actually a nested dictionary. So we have two keys that we need to look up on. We have the product type that tells us uh, the, the set of fields for that product. And then we have the set of fields. So what we have is uh, a dictionary that is going to contain the product key, and then it's going to contain a second dictionary that contains the field name and a array of string values that indicate valid values for that field name. So this is just where we're initializing this value. The script component has a pre-execute method. Uh, when you create one by default, this will be populated, and you, the only thing you'll see is space uh, pre-execute, and then a little code comment that says you can remove this if you don't need it. Um, generally, a good idea to remove it if you're not using it. In this case, we do want to use it. So what we're doing in pre-execute, we're going to go ahead and fetch all the business rule information and cache that. And the reason that we're doing this, again, is, is for performance. We want to get this up front. We want to store it. We don't want to have to keep going back and forth to, to the database to get it. Um, so what we're doing here is going through our connections object. This is pre-created for us uh, when the script code is generated. The business rules connection, which is the same name that we gave to the uh, connection manager in the properties page. And we call it our connection. And this is actually going to return a uh, connection object from that ADO.net connection manager, which we are going to cast to a DB connection so that we can make use of it. Um, we're going to create a command, and we're going to execute this statement, which basically just gets all the rows out of our product validation table. Um, executing the reader actually runs that, and we're going to iterate through the reader. Sorry, we, we, a little bit of error checking here, just to say if the reader has any rows, or does not have any rows, sorry, we didn't find any validation rules. This is a warning, because that's not necessarily a problem, but, it, it, but we do want to make sure that the user is aware that we didn't find any validation rules. Um, then we're going to actually load the rules uh, into our dictionary that we have up here. So this basically just iterates through the reader that we created, um, returns the values out of it into some variables, and then creates the appropriate objects in our dictionary. Uh, to give us the list of products, product types, the fields associated with each product type, and the list of values for it. So that gets us to the point of being initialized. Uh, we want to close the reader when we're done with it. Um, and at this point, basically, the connection is freed up. Something else can use it. Uh, so ideally, we want to be in and out of our database connections as quickly as possible. So in the process input row, uh, we are going to do a couple of things. We want to see, are there any role, row, yeah, excuse me, are there any rules defined for this particular product type? And are those rules being met? If they're not, we want to send it to the invalid output. So the first thing we do is on the validation rules dictionary, we do a try get value. Uh, if you're not familiar with dictionaries.net, this, this basically says, look for this particular key if you find it return it in this rules variable. If you don't find it, you're going to return false. So if it returns false in this if statement, we know there are no rules defined for this particular product type, so let's send it to the valid rows output. Again, this is pre-created for us by the, uh, the script um, engine based on the outputs and the fact that we set excluding groups. It knows that we have valid rows and valid rows as potential outputs for this. So if we don't find any rules, Fantastic. We can send this to the valid rows output. We're done processing with it, so we can go ahead and return. If we did find
define rules. We'll keep processing here. And we're going to call this process rule function. And we're going to pass in the row that we're processing, the collection of rules. Uh, and again, these are the rules for the specific product type that matches the row that we're currently working on. Uh, and we're going to pass in the column name that we want to process and then the value for that column. Uh, the is null checking is important. Um, in this case, size and color don't actually are not nullable columns in the database, so I could have skipped that. Capacity is nullable. Um, generally, it's good practice to check for nulls and make sure you use an appropriate default value on any time you're interacting with the data flow buffer. So uh, before we talk about the processing, uh, once we've processed the rules, go down to that method. So basically, what we're going to do in here is find a list of valid values. So we know the field name. It could be size, it could be color, it could be capacity. We're going to look up in our rules collection to see does that field name exist and is there a list of valid values associated with it. Um, if there's not, again, we're just going to return true, basically saying that there's nothing set up for this field, so it automatically is assumed that it's valid. Um, if we do find values, then we're going to See if that list of valid values has any item that matches the column value that we have. So this any method, again, part of the link library, uh, it basically says go through each item in the valid values array of string. Uh, we're going to say for each of those items in there, trim it, and then compare it to the column value, ignoring case. If we get a match, this is going to return true. If we don't get any matches, it will return false. So if it returns true, great, we have a valid value. If it doesn't return true, then we're going to set the field name into the field name column that we created on the invalid output. And we're going to add an error message, basically saying value, whatever the value of the column was, was not found in the valid value list, and we return false for that. So here, if any of the process rules returns false, we redirect to the invalid rows. Uh, and if it returns, if everything came back as true, then we redirect to the valid rows output. So this gives us uh, basically all the processing that we need to do to check these. And I am going to uh, go over here and we'll run this. And we should have, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, two, oh, sorry, I ended up executing the wrong package there. My apologies. Back to down into business rules, and we'll run this one. We should have two invalid rows. I'm oh, sorry, four invalid rows, not bad. And eight valid rows here. Uh, so everything that went through the valid rows basically unchanged. All the values match what we had in our valid values table. Um, however, anything that comes out on the invalid, uh, we found that the um, for this particular hiking shoe, we found that the size uh, value 4.1 is not in the valid values for the size field. Um, capacity 35 is not a valid value, 10 is not a valid value, uh, and size CO is not a valid value. So the nice part about this is we don't actually have to change any of our data flow processing uh, or our data flow logic itself if we want to add new valid values to this list. In fact, we can even add uh, additional product types with their own uh, new set of validation for size, color, and capacity without having to modify the data flow package at, at all. That is strictly a, 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 um, going in and modifying the table itself. So that, uh, that makes this, um, the package a little bit more flexible. You don't have to modify it in production. Uh, you can just update some data, which is uh, a pretty Pretty valuable thing in a lot of scenarios. So a couple of uh, tips and tricks. Um, since 2012, SSIS has supported debugging script component. Um, it still, while it's great to be able to do that, you can actually walk through the, the script component logic, it's still pretty slow. Um, it can be really, really slow. So often I find myself reverting to the same uh, thing that I used in 2008 and earlier versions which is using those uh, events, the fire information, fire warning, fire error, uh, to log what's actually happening behind the scenes, uh, which can 
uh, actually lead to me finding the issues a lot faster than a debug would. Particularly in the case that your first 150 rows that you process are great, and it's the 151st row that's, that's showing the issue. Um, debugging to actually get to that point can be um, <laughs> very time consuming and painful. Uh, we already uh, looked at this, but you can use the wrapper logic uh, that's automatically generated to really get a look at what is happening behind the scenes. Um, you do have the ability in your script component to override process input. So uh, if you recall when we looked at the wrappers, we looked at that process input that is basically internally calling the process input row method that does the row-by-row -row processing. Well, in some cases, it can be more effective to actually process things at the buffer level. Um, so in that case, inside your script component, you can actually override the process input method and handle the bus buffer processing yourself. You do have to be careful that if you do that, uh, that you either continue to call the base process input uh, implementation or that you implement the appropriate logic not to break the row-by-row the -row processing functionality unless you're really wanting to, to break that. So. Um, performance, a couple of uh, tips here. Uh, through task, there's not really a lot to be concerned about on the performance side there because uh, you're basically responsible for whatever's happening inside that side. So um, you don't have to worry a whole lot uh, outside of just making sure your code runs fairly effectively. Script components are a little bit more complicated. And again, one of the things that uh, occasionally you'll see is uh, somebody new to it will do an operation in process input row that is particularly slow and painful, whether that's going to a database, uh, a complex calculation, creating values that are just getting uh, recreated every time a row is processed. Um, one, of, one example of this is uh, if you're doing any type of regex processing, uh, a lot of people use scripts to do that. Um, regexes are actually kind of slow to create, but in a lot of cases you'll see people in process input actually creating a regex object. In 99% of cases, you're much better off if it's going to be the same value for every row that comes in, create that at the instance level, store it there, reuse it across every row. Uh, that will make things much, much faster for you. Um, the script component, I've seen a lot of people complain, well, it's just not as fast as using the building component. It can be really, really close to the building component if you write the script component properly. Um, so if, it, if you're noticing real slowdowns with your script component, it's, it's a good time to look at it and say, okay, am I actually doing everything the way I should be doing? The other thing is make sure you're caching as much information as possible. Again, if you're going to a database for information, do you need to go to that database every time a row comes through, or can you go to the database and get the information once up front and keep it cached? Um, the other thing, particularly if you're doing your own process input processing, um, you will be interacting with some of the COM interfaces. So uh, if, if you're really familiar with the data flow, you may be aware that under the covers, the data flow is all the COM-based engine. So all the .NET pieces that we work on in script component are basically a layer on top of that. If you've used the default script component implementation, Microsoft's done a pretty good job of optimizing that so that it's not uh, it's about as fast as it can be, and it doesn't over overly use the COM interfaces. It caches where appropriate, et cetera. Um, if you start writing your own logic, it's pretty easy to to not cache those things. And because the common interfaces look like just anything else, you don't realize that there's actually a pretty hefty overhead involved in calling those. There's a lot of internal uh, marsh marshalling of memory as well as uh, conversions from one, uh, one type of value to another when you're interacting with the COM uh, objects and you want to avoid those. So generally, anything that starts with IDTS if it starts with that, you want to try to cache that reference if at all possible and, and not access it more than is absolutely necessary. Um, keeping it dry. So this is an acronym for don't repeat yourself. Uh, basically, if you write a lot of scripts, you will start writing a lot of repetitious code because in a lot of cases, you need the same logic to do things uh, across many, many different script components. 
So there's a couple of things here. Um, one, make some generic functions uh, that can handle working with different uh, types of columns and reuse those across that can still be copy and paste reuse. So you end up copying and pasting those same generic functions in every script component. Again, something you want to try to avoid. So in a lot of cases, it can be valuable to move those out into custom.net assemblies. Uh, just start a class library project, add your functions there as public uh, functions on a public class, and then reference those from inside your script tasks and script components. And that lets you store that logic in one place, update it in one place, but use it in multiple, multiple scripts. Um, the one thing here is generally those assemblies need to be installed into the GAC, which does require administrative access, but that makes sure that SSIS can actually find the assembly regardless of how the package is being run. So a couple of uh, key points to remember, scripts are really flexible. I love scripts. I write a lot of them. Um, you can certainly overuse them. So sometimes there are ways to accomplish things uh, through creative use of the built-in component. Um, in a lot of cases, if there is a built-in way to do something, don't write a script for it. Um, <laughs> generally, you're better off using the built-in uh, where, where possible. We showed some examples today where it's, it's pretty difficult to accomplish using the built-in uh, components, and the scripts actually make things a lot cleaner and more understandable. That's a good place to use a script. But if you're using a script just because you prefer to write .NET code, then use the, the SSIS component. And that's that's uh, probably going to lead to less than optimal results. Um, when you're doing scripts, um, again, look at where the functionality belongs. Is it something that could be used, done using a built-in component? Um, if it's a script, great, but is the logic in the script going to be used in multiple places? At that point, you need to start thinking about, is this better to put into an external assembly like we just talked about that can be referenced from multiple scripts, or is this perhaps suited to, to actually upsize your script into a custom task for components. Uh, and that's uh, beyond the scope of this presentation, but uh, certainly possible, particularly if you have a lower end script in the first place. Um, also, when you're testing, you want to make sure you test for not just the functionality, the script does what you expect it to, but also that you test the performance. Uh, again, it's pretty easy to write a script that performs really well on 20 rows. Uh, the same script may be very, very poorly performing when it comes to a million rows or more. So testing the performance of what you've done is, is very important. Okay, uh, that is pretty much all I had. A uh, couple of resources. Again, my blog has uh, quite a few examples of writing scripts, uh, logic, and SSIS. Um, one of the best books, this is an old book, but it's still one of the, one of the go-to references for scripting um, for me, is uh, Donald Farmer's Rational Guide to Extending SSIS 2005 with Scripts. Um, it's all VB. Um, if you if you know that, you, you can translate that pretty easily into C sharp if that's your preferred language. Uh, but it really talks a lot about some of the, the plumbing and the, the deeper internals. So very useful there. So um, that's all I had. Uh, Liz, do we have any uh, questions that we need to answer? Yeah, we have a couple. Um, someone wants to know what version of Visual Studio you're using. I am using Visual Studio 2013 with the um, version of SSDT BI for, for BS 2013. So you can use this in, they don't have SSDT BI for Visual Studio 2015 yet, uh, but it is available, um, pretty much everything I showed is available in any version prior to BS 2015. Uh, and this, this will also be available in BS 2015 as soon as they release a version of SSDT yeah, that supports 2015. Okay. And um, now, sorry, one other thing. You don't actually need a full version of Visual Studio in order to do anything that I showed today. If you just install the SSDT BI version of Visual Studio, that will give you all the, the, the functionality you need to work with scripts. Okay. Um, Someone wants to know why you should calculate running totals in SSIS and not in T-SQL. Is there a benefit? Um, it, it, a lot of it boils down to where you want your processing to be and are you working with a SQL-based data store or not. Uh, so 
that, that's a <laughs> that's a classic debate when it comes to SSIS. Uh, should should you do the work in SSIS or should you do it in the database engine? Um, it really the answer is it depends, and I can't believe that's the first time I've said that in the entire presentation. I think that's the <laughs> It really uh, does depend on the state. If if the if you're doing most of your your data processing in the SQL Server engine, then I would lean toward calculating it there. If you're doing most of your data processing in SSIS uh, for the the business rules and the calculation processing and those types of things, then you're probably going to want it in SSIS. Sometimes it's a forced decision because you may be working with a data store that doesn't handle doing running total calculations, which was the case for SSIS. SQL Server up till uh, we got the uh, T-SQL window in functions. So um, it, it really it depends on exactly what sources you're working with and, and where you prefer to implement that type of option. Uh, there's not really a right or wrong answer as far as you know, if, if SQL works for you, do it in SQL. If it works for you in SSIS, do it there. Okay. Uh, someone wants to know how you get SSIS to connect to links. Linux boxes, sorry. Uh, sorry, I missed that last part. Uh, how to get SSIS to connect to Linux boxes? Um, so that's a, that's a big question. Uh, so the way that I most commonly have done that uh, is through the, um, uh, I cannot not think of the name of it. It's the, the Linux uh, remoting. I cannot, I, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on it as soon as you ask that question. Uh, the, the, um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a complete blank. It's the shell execution program for Linux. Um, but typically if I have to interact with, with things on a Unix or Linux system, then uh, I end up using the Windows command line clients to execute shell commands on Linux. Um, and I, from those, you, you can do an execute process task within SSIS to call the Windows command line that talks to the, the, the shell program on Linux. Hopefully, the, hopefully that's not information for, for them to, to look that up. I, I, I'm just drawing a blank on the name of the program right now. Okay. Um, can you access SSIS variables in custom assemblies using DTS? Uh, you cannot access SSIS variables in custom assembly directly. You can pass the values from the variables into the custom assembly, and you can pass references to the variables into them. Uh, but the custom assembly uh, generally won't have access to the DTS object model unless you write some really explicit code to enable that. Um, personal preference on that is I, I rather just pass the underlying values in the variable to the custom assembly so that the, the custom assembly doesn't actually have to have references to the SSIS object model. Okay. Um, what add-on is needed to be able to create database objects in Visual Studio? Uh, so that is, uh, in Visual Studio 2013, that's not actually an add-on. It's part of what comes out of the box with the, well, with the Visual Studio shell, but it's the SSDT not SSDT-BI um, plugin that en enables the database projects as part of the Visual Studio project. Okay. Um, if you can search SSDT, you'll find that. <laughs> okay. Uh, last question, I think, because we're pretty much over time. Uh, what is the best approach to extract data from websites using SSIS? Um, to extract data from websites, it depends on what format the data is in. So if you're talking about reading HTML, um, then I would lean toward, well, it, it's going to be scripts in either case. Um, pulling data from HTML-based uh, web pages via script or any other method is, is uh, somewhat time-consuming. So <laughs> honestly, I might look at something like Power Query, which has some some pretty nice built-in functionality for that. Uh, if the website exposes the data through a REST interface uh, or a REST API, uh, then the script component makes it relatively easy. Um, if, it's, if it delivers uh, JSON formatted data from the REST API, then the, there's a JSON.NET 
a set of class libraries that uh, there's Newton solved JSON if you search for that. Um, that makes working with JSON formatted data in, in inside of your scripts extremely easy. Uh, and so that's that's uh, generally if the website offers a REST API, that would be the, the method that I would use to pull the data out of. Okay. All right, guys, we are out of time. We actually went a little bit over today. Um, if you have any questions, again, John's email is there up on the screen. Um, you can also email me, Liz. Um, it's the email that comes with all your go-to webinar signups. Um, and to any questions we didn't get in the questions panel, I'll make sure to send those to John. Um, as always, our session is recorded, and it will be posted on our website by the end of the week. Uh, thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, Liz.